Five, four, three, two, one. Impact. A collision between a car and a motorcycle occurs near the intersection of A2 and A223 in Bexley, southeast of London City. A 999 call is placed for a motorcyclist who is bleeding from a right compound tibia fibula fracture. The patient is unresponsive but has a pulse. The emergency dispatcher calls London Air Ambulance for a possible activation. They sound the alarm. Less than four minutes later, a McDonnell Douglas 902 helicopter lifts off from the helipad of Royal London Hospital. 15 minutes later, it arrives at the scene of the accident. The physician and paramedic on board disembark and begin to examine the patient. The physician's examination reveals that the patient has likely broken their right femur in addition to their tibia and fibula. While the ground ambulance crew were able to stabilize the external bleeding, the physician fears internal bleeding due to the proximity of the femoral head to the femoral arteries. As the paramedic leads the ground ambulance crew in immobilizing the leg with foam blocks and a splint, the physician draws and administers a dosage of ketamine, a powerful sedative, to ensure that the patient will not remember the traumatic incident and will feel less pain. The physician then makes the decision to transport via helicopter. In less than an hour since the accident, the motorcyclist is wheeled into the trauma bay of Royal London Hospital. The physician explains the patient's history, nature of the crash, and medications already administered. And so it begins. The fragility of life necessitates care when things go wrong. With their ability to operate in difficult to reach environments and at higher speeds than the traditional emergency medicine system, helicopters offer a compelling alternative to the traditional ground-based ambulance system we have today. My name is Joshua Hockman, and while I would love to tell you all about the wonderful work of the London Air Ambulance and air ambulance organizations across the UK, the truth is, Success stories don't always make for great TED Talks. See, the fictional story I just described may sound thrilling and exciting to many Americans who don't see air ambulances in day-to-day -day life. However, by UK air ambulance standards, this classification of mission is boring and baseline. This raises the question as to what role do air ambulances serve in the US? The expected answer likely parallels the missions of organizations like the University of Wisconsin's MedFlight program, who flies an emergency medicine trained physician and flight nurse to scenes of accidents across the state of Wisconsin. The mental image of a physician running out of a helicopter, delivering life-saving life care in the streets, and then performing a medevac to the nearest hospital is awe-inspiring. However, MedFlight, in many ways, is the exception, not the rule. An investigation by Sam Denby of Wendover Productions found that two-thirds of air ambulance missions flown in the U.S. are inter-facility. This means the helicopter is transporting a patient from a lower to a higher level of trauma care, usually from a rural hospital to an urban center. While being the statistical minority, the medical efficacy of medevac flights are still called into question. A study looking at response times of air ambulances in the Silicon Valley found that helicopters were only faster than ground ambulances about 55% of the time. However, because the overwhelming majority of flights in the US are flown without a physician on board, the life-saving capabilities of these helicopters closely resembles those of ground ambulances. While our peers across the pond are able to enjoy higher levels of HEMS intervention, interestingly enough, they do so without receiving a bill. This is because air ambulances in the UK operate as charities, relying on government funding 
and private donations to deliver their life-saving care. By contrast, a cursory Google search for American Air Ambulance Bill shows bills into the tens of thousands of dollars. As seen on the far right of this image, the line in yellow shows that in 2017, the median air ambulance bill for Americans was $24,000, with the 90th percentile at the very top, $52,000. As we can see with the growth over time, from 2008 to 2017, these bills have more than doubled. Wanting to understand why this is the reality of our American air ambulance system, I reached out to Dr. Michael Abernethy, the chief flight physician of the University of Wisconsin's med flight program. With 20 years of experience in the field, Dr. Abernethy is considered by many to be the nation's expert on this niche topic. I'll even admit, given my obsession with air ambulances, Dr. Abernethy is a bit of a hero of mine. I mean, this picture right here resembles my career goals. I had the immense privilege of reaching out and speaking with Dr. Abernethy this past summer, and I cannot thank him enough for his insight in helping my research. When asked about the billing systems found in air ambulances today, Dr. Abernethy had this to say. The Airline Deregulation Act has done nothing but increase prices and decrease quality, both medical and aviation. Since the beginning of commercial flight, air carriers, whether they're air mail, air cargo, or airlines, were subject to extreme government oversight. In 1938, this was called the Civil Aeronautics Board, and they had jurisdiction over flight routes, flight schedules, flight fares, flight times, and safety regulations. Naturally, this heavy oversight was met with increasing criticism as the commercial sector expanded, ultimately boiling over into the Airline Deregulation Act, ratified in 1978. In short, this act removed much of the government's control at the federal and state level over airlines. The, it, this deregulation opened the free market to air carriers, leading to better competition, better routes, and cheaper prices, meaning it was hailed as a win for both airlines and passengers alike. Like it did in 1978, two words have just slipped by this audience. This deregulation opened the free market to air carriers. This term, air carrier, is broader than airline, which the bill was originally intended for. As a result, air ambulances fall under the jurisdiction of the Airline Deregulation Act. This interpretation has been upheld in court as recently as August of 2021, and as it turns out, the implications of this ever so slight turn of a phrase are immense. First, because the Airline Deregulation Act bars government intervention in pricing, air ambulances can charge what they want. While in the passenger airlines, this competition led to decreased prices and was hailed as a win for consumers, there is no free market in an emergency. As a patient is dying in the street, they don't have the time to call around and shop for the best price. The helicopter flying the mission is flying the mission. End of story. With this opportunity to generate profit, it follows that many patients fear air ambulances. While it is true that patients often have some sort of insurance to help mitigate these costs, a study by the Government Accountability Office showed that 70% of air ambulance flights are considered out of network. This means the patient's insurance company does not have a formal contract with the air ambulance operator resulting in greater out-of-pocket expenses as seen previously. With an open market, it follows that air ambulance organizations have been on the rise in recent years. Unfortunately, 
This expansion of air ambulance providers has not seen a similar expansion in geographic areas covered. Recall that the Airline Deregulation Act pro prohibits government intervention in fares and routes. Because of this, the 400 air ambulance operators that have opened in the last couple decades, of those 400 operators, the majority of them share at least 50% of their geographic catchment area with another air ambulance company. Anecdotally, Dr. Abernethy discussed a situation in which rival air ambulance companies opened up bases at the same airport, just a couple hundred feet away from each other. In what other vital industry do we see this level of competition? Rival fire stations don't rush out to the scenes of house fires to try and put it out first. Police officers aren't paid extra for making arrests outside of their jurisdiction. Even ground ambulance companies have designated contracts and geographic areas within which they operate. Because of this, questions are raised as to whether the expansion of air ambulance providers in the US is truly about saving more lives or if it's simply profit driven. If the latter, as many experts suspect, it follows that certain corners will be cut to maximize profits. A key indicator Dr. Abernethy pointed out was the usage of single engine helicopters. Wanting to clarify, I asked him why single engine helicopters and he had this to say, there are more single engine helicopters involved in fatal accidents than twins and it's not because they're falling out of the air. Is single engine technology a surrogate for decision making? Are the programs that will fly a 30 year old single engine helicopter going to invest in pilot training? Are they going to invest money into other safety measures? In short, the US air ambulance system is broken. As I close, I want to make it clear, I take no issue with the many employees of air ambulance organizations in the US who no doubt deliver the highest level of care that they can with the expertise and training they have. I can't even fault the corporations and companies that have opened up in recent years. They saw a hole in the market and they chose to fill it. What I will say is that as voters, as citizens, as contributors to society, it is paramount that we consider all possible ramifications of the decisions and choices we make every day. Unforeseen consequences have the potential to shatter important pillars of our daily life and well-being. And if this happens, there may not be an air ambulance to save us. Thank you.